the process, which is probably the most useful thing that kids can come out of school with. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's really a, a, a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree with you. I agree with those points. But there is still the reason I made them is that there is this, in my experience anyway, this public perception of, of, of a need for certitude. Yes, I think that's right. Mm. Um, the same thing with um, this recent uh, uh, stock market crisis. I mean, c decisions made under conditions of uncertainty. The neuroscience of all of that. If, if the people had understood more of the neuroeconomics of all of this sort of stuff, perhaps it wouldn't have gone in this direction. I have no idea. But, but let me go back to a point that, that um, I think Brian made earlier, which is the, or maybe it was Richard, the the, the fact that there's no overnight revolutions. Um, what was it? 14 April 1953. The Crick and Watson paper was published on the DNA, the structure of uh, the structure of DNA. There were virtually no citations of that paper no increase in the number of scientists, uh, apart from the fact that it wasn't refereed, remember, because the, 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 the enterprise of science at that point did not even have referees for journals, so it just got in because the editor thought it was a good paper. Especially in Nature. You know how right. the, the editor of Nature worked then? It was John Maddox, was it? No, but no? Before, before, before John, John Maddox. Maddox yeah. He took a briefcase full of papers to the Athenaeum Club in London, <laughs> where all the members were sitting back in their armchairs <laughs> after lunch, snoozing, handing out papers and then he would come back at tea time and pick them all up again, they having been refereed. That <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's, it's, things have changed slightly. Yeah. Um, I think. Uh, <laughs> so the, the, the action, there, are, there are two points in, There are two points in here. One point is that the, the, crick, uh, uh, the DNA paper, the classic paper, itself did not start being cited in, in large numbers until roughly 1990, when the Human Genome Project got into gear. In other words, when the technologization of it all started that, happening. That well, that's, but that's right. not so surprising. Yeah, we uh, talked about it. I mean, great, uh, really important advances aren't I've, obvious I've, at the time, mm. uh, all the time. I mean, we, we've had, we, we had... There's a massive, there's a, well, there's a spike. But we had, you know, at this meeting, Steve Weinberg here, you know, won the Nobel Prize for the Standard Model, and his paper wasn't cited uh, at all. Uh, for years afterwards, yeah. and, and I think it happens in every one of our well, fields. The Darwin, well, Darwin, Darwin Wallace paper you, was, was you completely ignored that. in 1858. Yes, um, it's I mean, part of it also that, that uh, science doesn't work from canonical texts, and the actual paper is not that big a deal compared to the idea that once an idea becomes so obviously mm -hmm. true that it becomes second nature, you don't need to cite the original source. If I, cite the yeah. inver if I mention the inverse square law, I don't need to have a footnote attributing mm -hmm. it to... Yeah, yeah exactly. To, once to it's Newton, important, yeah. it's... it's it's, it's and background. I think with Watson and Crick, I mean, I don't know how many people ha felt a need to cite that paper once it just became the indispensable infrastructure yeah. of biology. I think the point was that it still took a while, as as with the with the reading at the Linnaean Society of the Darwin and Wallace papers, for it even to penetrate what was going on. I think it can uh, happen both ways. I mean, there's certainly a, I'm aware of papers that really changed people's thinking fairly significantly in terms of what they were going to work on. That paper came out, and they just changed their research yeah. and focused upon it. Again, it didn't wipe out the core of the science that went before. It just had enough of a compelling story to be, to tell. <coughs> Maps, you don't like that word. No, no, no. It, had, I like a, it, yeah. it had, had enough of a new direction that people said, this is something I really want to work on. They'd shift immediately. And yes, as you say, there are other examples where you know technology needs to catch up before you can really make yeah. use of it. And that's the, a, as but a I think the bottom line is the core is stable. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> but, but we, you know, the, all of us have been, we all probably have to write research grants and proposals, and it always amazes me because you're supposed to be talking about what you're going to be doing four years down the road. And if science is any good, you don't know what you're going to be doing four years down the road. Let me play devil's advocate for a minute and take that point beyond where it was going. The second point that came out of that was, um, I've spoken to a number of scientists who would actually say, if they had to write a headline, science is broken. And what they meant by that is that there's too many people trying to get too many papers into too few journals. The refereeing process is very difficult. It's not people sitting at the Athenaeum passing the thing around. And, it's, and somehow it, there needs to be a different kind of refereeing system for, each pe for people to judge their work, that maybe there shouldn't be anonymous referees, maybe people should have to sign their referee. Do you have a sense of any of this? Because that's, that's, a, that's another part of the community, how the community is arranged. No, I think, I think, I think it's a, 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 a cogent point in that we scientists probably have not applied scientific self-scrutiny to our own cultural norms as much as we should. It's been taken for granted that peer review is the only ritual that can sanctify a finding, <laughs> even though we know from studies of peer review that it has a number of systematic flaws. <laughs> the name, uh, the reputation of the person writing the paper makes too big a difference, which you can always guess even when it's blacked out. 
too much depends arbitrarily on the choice of referees. If you just pick two people, uh, that is such a small sample that uh, the outcome is going to be determined by whether you have someone that's sympathetic or not to the basic approach. And there are alternatives. I think we've inherited a practice that comes from the era in which paper was a limiting resource, that mailing out copies of a journal was so expensive that only a small number of organizations could do it. Now that we do have the, the internet and the, uh, as a form of disseminating information and space is basically limitless, limitless we should look to other models well, of quality control. Not, and like PLOS, the Public Library mm -hmm. of Science, which has some different techniques such as people can post comments on published papers and so if a bad paper gets published it will live in with the ignominy of all of the critical remarks yeah I'm not you know I, I I've been in that position recently as uh, in, in, in a, one of the positions I have in the American Physical Society which published this unpeer-reviewed journal which and there was a uh, uh, global warming p p uh, uh, skeptics paper that got into it, and, and 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 then it was interpreted immediately as a scientific finding. I, I tend to think I'm not sure. There is an editor friend of mine who would like to publish every paper he gets along with the referees report beside it, but and that's one possibility. It would make better referees reports. I think that's for sure. But but I think it's peer review is like democracy. You know, it's sort of it's not. It's got a lot of problems, but I, right now I think it it, it works and on average and. And I don't know if there's a better system because the problem with the internet is there's no filter. At some level, if you want to, if, if, if you, there's so much information out there and so little time to read, we already get too many papers that we can read. We have to, I think, as a community, have some filter that, that allows us to select out. Let me just well, make a radical uh, suggestion that maybe we should evaluate the different methods empirically. Uh, oh, as scientists, yeah. see well, which that's one. A, that's not we, a bad idea. But, but along those lines, uh, Lawrence, <laughs> do you actually read peer reviewed? Articles? No, that, you, 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 Brian's exactly right. In our field, by the time it gets peer reviewed, it's old news. Yeah, I mean, so we basically, everything goes on our online archive, and archive. we just choose what we want to read. And, and we decide what's garbage on our own as opposed to reading it in the journal and saying it's garbage. More or less. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a difficulty with that, though, and that, that is that you know, so some people are competent to. Uh, differentiate between stuff that's rubbish and stuff that isn't. And then there are a lot of people out there who aren't really competent yeah, to make that. And, and th this is why, um, providing one's careful about this, that there is some utility in a bottleneck system, uh, which serves to some extent at any rate as an expert filter for what comes through. I mean, you, you, you could have a situation where let anybody publish what they like on the internet. In fact, they can already. If you've, you've written a paper and you want to publish it on your blog site or something, yeah, you can exactly. go ahead and do it. So uh, th th there's no reason why absolutely anything that gets written shouldn't be out there. But what you do want is to have some sort of uh, uh, imprimatur. You want, you want some sort of recognition that peers, that colleagues, are prepared to take this seriously and, and discuss it and so on. And after all, peer review and publication in the, in the traditional way is anyway only one step in the life of, a, of a, an idea or a paper. And there are going to be lots of other things that are tested too. When people try and you know, replicate those results or something, they may well find out that, in fact, uh, the, the stuff doesn't work, and, and that's going to be a check on it. So, so I, I think there is something to be said for um, obliging things if they are going to have a, a little bit of a stamp of, of acceptability on it from the profession, that there should be a, a bit of a bottleneck, providing that it doesn't result in a lot of good stuff and very innovative stuff just being excluded, as could well happen with something which is really genuinely original. Well, it's more archival in a sense. We, you know, we don't. There's not every piece of paper in this room that we're going to. Record, keep for posterity, mm -hmm. and we tend. I think uh, peer review in journals, in some sense, have now become our archiv archival. It's more a record of those things which seem to represent progress in the field, as opposed to the things which really drive progress for it right now, which are the, uh, probably before, at least in physics, before yeah, peer review. But, but there's, there's an interesting point here, which which um, one of the writers for Science, the magazine, John Cohen, made at a, at a meeting the other day, which was he was saying that the way most undergraduates and maybe graduates as well and postdocs get their information is to go online to PubMed and put in their institution's um, yeah. subscription, download the PDF of the specific paper and they're done. Well, half of the book of a journal like Nature or Science, the front half of the book is not papers, it's context. It's what is the science community doing and what's the world doing about science? It's got all the, the news stories in there, the context, the commentary and so on. And very few of them actually physically touch these things anymore. Now, is that a loss? I mean, are, context is... Well, yeah. if, if it's correct context, <laughs> I mean, I think, although, you know, I don't, I'm not sure I agree because at least 
I, most of us probably get a lot of our stuff at electronically now anyway. And, and uh, as far as science and nature is concerned, I tend to get their weekly news. I mean, I get on my, in, on my email mm. the, the, all the context and commentary that would have come in the front half You'd of that You'd be surprised if, even, if you, even if you're talking about an ordinary newspaper, how many people you'll go to when they're reading the online version will suddenly, because they're staying at a hotel or something, get a newspaper and they'll say, I, had, I found such really interesting stories here that I'd never <laughs> have seen before because it was online. Yeah, there, wonder, there is a, there's an amazing a, service that will actually download <laughs> and print stories on hard copy and deliver it to you <laughs> in your mailbox. <laughs> it's called magazines. No, it's revolutionary. I mean, no, but you I know do. what? It, it's, we're all of a pretty well a similar generation, I think. Um, and I'm wondering, I, I, it's an, it'll be an interesting empirical study. I'm wondering if my daughter's generation or her children's generation, when there's one, will in fact find it much more comfortable to read things online. For example, I bet all of us made this transition. When I first started to write scientific papers, at the beginning, it was very difficult for me to do things on computers. Mm -hmm. But now, I can't handwrite uh, anything. And, and that transition has been made. And it could just be that we're, we're just dinosaurs ourselves, and we're relics of this paper uh, generation. And it's not easy for us to get information that way, and that the next generation will find it much more comfortable to do that. I, I don't I, know. I think Anthony's objection to the um, putting it on your blog and uh, I mean the, the need for a filter mm. is met if other people recommend it. I mean, I mean, I often get 